This is lecture two, uh, part one. I've broken up this lecture into three uh, different parts. Uh, this is a lecture on the historical context of social welfare policy, uh, so that'll be the main uh, theme. Uh, we'll cover all other uh, themes as well. So I'm taking a look at the outline here. Uh, the first part uh, of this lecture, we'll be talking about uh, three helping conundrums. Uh, these are arguments put forth by uh, a man named uh, David Elwood, a very famous uh, liberal policy scholar, uh, essentially saying that our history uh, is littered uh, with these uh, conundrums. We see these themes over and over, and we'll take a look at what these conundrums are. Uh, we'll look at uh, the history. Uh, we'll look at the British Poor Laws. We'll go all the way back to 1601. Uh, one of the major pieces of, of first major pieces of uh, social welfare policy legislation uh, we'll take a look at some of the main features of that legislation, uh, and we'll see how those features were carried over uh, into the early uh, relief system in the U.S., uh, and so we'll take a look at the U.S. system as well, of course, uh, and how it uh, borrowed uh, largely from the British system. Uh, we'll then take a little bit of a detour, uh, not so much a detour, but uh, we'll get into discussion about the origins of social work. Uh, so while not necessarily uh, speaking to the history of social welfare policy, uh, it, I think it's relevant uh, insofar as it helps us understand the history of the profession, at least. Uh, and then uh, we'll get into uh, arguably the most important part in this section, and that's a discussion of the Great Depression, uh, the New Deal uh, era, uh, in which uh, the Social Security Act of 1935 uh, was signed. Uh, and then uh, in part three of this lecture, uh, we'll look at uh, the structure that was set in place in the Social Security Act of 1935, the social insurance uh, public assistance, uh, this sort of, this structure. We'll take a look at that uh, and we'll uh, look at some of the characteristics of social insurance programs uh, and the public assistance programs and how that, uh, how those programs are organized. Uh, so uh, we'll start with uh, the first part. Uh, so in terms of a conundrum, so what is a conundrum? Uh, I'm looking at the American uh, Heritage uh, Dictionary uh, and this is what they have to say. They say that it's a problem with, uh, with only a satisfactory uh, solution. So there is really no uh, clear solution uh, to some issue is what the definition is essentially saying, right? Uh, I'm looking at the Webster's Dictionary. Uh, Webster's Dictionary offers a similar definition. They say it's a question or a problem with only a conjectural answer. So you can only guess as to what the answer might be. Uh, David Elwood uh, defines a conundrum in this way. He says that it's uh, basically a damned if you do, a damned if you don't situation. So essentially you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Uh, so uh, he talks about this conundrum, this idea of a conundrum, because uh, the idea is that our social welfare policy history is littered uh, with conundrums. Uh, in the language of economists, uh, you might think of these as sort of uh, trade-offs. Uh, so for example, uh, there's often thought to be a trade-off between uh, equality and efficiency. The more we try to uh, ensure a certain measure of equality, uh, there, is, there might be an effect on efficiency or productivity. Uh, and so uh, this is, uh, these are the ideas here, right? The conundrum is that we have these uh, damned if you do, damned if you don't situations uh, littered throughout our social welfare policy history. So keep, keep in mind these arguments as we go through this uh, history section, please. Uh, the first conundrum is a security work conundrum. And we've seen this argument before. Uh, when we were discussing Rawlsian uh, uh, liberals and the Rawlsian uh, liberalism. Uh, but uh, the basic idea is this. Uh, it's the, no uh, the notion that if the government is providing some measure of security to the citizens, right, if there is a safety net in place, in other words, uh, then that necessarily uh, leads to uh, less, of a work, uh, uh, less of a work effort or less uh, productivity, on the other hand. Right? So there's a trade-off between security and work is the basic argument. Uh, I, I said before, we saw this in the Rawlsian context, so uh, we talked about the idea of a social minimum before, and that uh, if you set the social minimum too high, that it may have an impact on efficiency. So it's a similar argument here. Uh, but uh, Elwood is saying that there's really two ways to think about this. Uh, you can think of, uh, think of this in, in a sort of a psychological aspect, and there's also an economic aspect to it, the way we've thought about it before. But in terms of the psychological aspect, uh, he's saying that uh, if the government is providing this sort of safety net to everyone, then it uh, just simply reduces the pressure uh, for people to work. It's a psychological uh, argument, right? That uh, you have less uh, pressure, uh, psychologically speaking. And of course, the economic aspect of this uh, is that uh, if you provide greater security uh, to the citizens via some sort of safety net, government safety net, uh, 
then the incentive, the incentive to work hard uh, goes down. Uh, that's uh, the major, uh, those are the major lines of thinking here. Uh, the next conundrum or theme that you'll see throughout uh, policy history or social policy history is the assistance uh, family structure conundrum. And here, uh, the idea is that once again, if the government is providing assistance uh, to those in need, uh, that uh, you may be inducing changes uh, in the family structure. Uh, whether or not it was intentional, uh, that's sort of, uh, that's neither here nor there, but uh, the idea is that uh, if the government is once again establishing some sort of a safety net or uh, perhaps is being more generous with its benefits, especially in the 60s and 70s when the government was a little more generous in the way of, in the way of uh, welfare benefits, when welfare was an entitlement program, uh, then uh, you're going to uh, see some changes uh, in the family structure. So uh, conservatives uh, will argue that uh, the changes in family that we saw uh, throughout the 60s, 70s, and so on, uh, up to uh, this uh, new century, uh, may have been caused by the welfare system, by the generosity of the welfare system. Uh, so I think you get, you get the idea here, right? The fact that uh, if we're providing assistance to one type of family, for example, single-headed uh, families, uh, then uh, we're incentivizing that particular family structure, is the argument. Uh, the last argument here is a targeting uh, isolation conundrum uh, the idea is that uh, uh, we're starting out uh, with limited resources, so we have uh, limited resources to go around, uh, and so uh, naturally uh, we want to we want to channel those resources th to those most in need. Uh, but uh, the catch is, uh, the more effectively we target those resources, uh, we end up isolating uh, the people who receive those services or those benefits. Uh, it's a stigma argument. The more effectively you target your resources, the more you end up uh, stigmatizing. Uh, the poor are those who receive those benefits or services. Uh, like I said, you'll see these arguments uh, throughout, these themes, I should say, uh, uh, reflected uh, in the history of social welfare policy that we'll see uh, in the next uh, two parts of this lecture.